Good morning uh, or good evening, depending on uh, where our, our viewers are joining from. Um, on behalf of Refugees International and the Women's Peace Network, I want to thank you uh, for joining and welcome you to this webinar on addressing the Bogue crisis uh, of the Rohingya. Um, this is, uh, you know, a, a very timely event with uh, with what we've seen happening um, with more and more Rohingya refugees taking to these dangerous voyages by sea. Uh, I'm joined by a, a great panel who I'll, I'll introduce and turn to in just a minute. Uh, but first, just to um, just to, to set the set the scene and, and uh, introduce myself, I am uh, Dan Sullivan. I am the uh, director for Africa, Asia, and the Middle East with Refugees International. I uh, have been covering the Rohingya and traveling to the camps for a number of years. Um, we, um, we're going to uh, talk to each of the people on the panel, do a sort of question and answer. Um, but first, um, just to give some background, uh, we've seen that over the past year, there's been a precipitous rise in the number of people taking to sea, um, more than 3,000 uh, in the past year, according to uh, the UN Refugee Agency. And of those, more than 300 are believed to have lost their lives. That's the highest numbers we've seen since uh, 2014, 2015. There's a lot of reasons um, behind these, these journeys, and we'll get into that a little bit in this discussion. But of course, there's the, uh, the root causes of the treatment of the Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, just a few days ago, we marked two years since the, uh, the coup by the Myanmar military. Um, and it's been more than five years since the genocide uh, perpetrated against the Rohingya which uh, led to hundreds of thousands uh, fleeing into Bangladesh, where, where now we see the, the largest refugee settlement in the world. Um, and uh, I, I've traveled there many times over the years, uh, again, most recently, the end of last year, and, and can say in speaking to the, the Rohingya refugees and to people working with them, there is, there's a palpable sense of, of growing despair and, and a loss of hope um, as, as this gets prolonged and as people see what's happening in Myanmar and see little hope of, of return in, the, in the, the near future. They also face many restrictions on their uh, access to quality education, um, freedom of movement, um, and, uh, and just the ability to, to meet and, and organize a civil society. So uh, a lot of challenges there, a lot of different things we can get into on what's uh, driving this, this, this boat crisis. Um, I'll just say one, one other personal reflection that uh, this, is, this is not something new. Um, I remember being in the region uh, after uh, the, the May 2015 boat crisis, where we saw some 3,000 uh, Rohingya and Bangladeshis uh, stranded at sea when there was a crackdown on the on the trafficking networks. And I remember speaking to one of the uh, a young Rohingya girl who had uh, tread water for hours um, before being saved. And at that time, it got a lot of attention. There was a ministerial level uh, meetings across the region uh, to address. Uh, what was happening, a lot of uh, great ideas that were put out there on, on working together for safe disembarkation, for uh, creating tr trust funds to better respond to this kind of a crisis. Unfortunately, uh, we see what's happening today that uh, not, not much has changed in that way. So um, I, I know that in a few days, there'll be another ministerial level meeting as part of the, the Bali process. Um, and uh, I hope that uh, I hope that some of the, the folks involved in that can can see this and hear these the messages we're going to share today. So with that, let me turn it over to our great uh, panelists. We have first Mohammed Rezawan, who is a 25 year old Rohingya refugee. He is a, a who lives in the camps in in Cox's Bazaar. He is a writer and folklorist, the author of Rohingya folk tales, um, and has done a lot of great work. Uh, helping journalists and researchers who have visited the camps. Um, secondly, we have Wei Wei Nu, who is um, the uh, founder of the Women's Peace Network, who we're happy to have as a, a co-sponsor for this event. Uh, Wei Wei spent uh, seven years as a political prisoner in Myanmar uh, before emerging as a, um, as a leading um, human rights and, and women's rights activist. Um, Wei Wei uh, got a, a degree in law from, from Yangon University and from Berkeley, uh, and continues to do uh, great work um, on, on Rohingya activism and, and more broadly on women's rights and human rights. And then our third panelist is um, Yuyun Wayun Ingram, who is the uh, chair and representative of, the, um, of Indonesia to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. Um, Yuyun is also a PhD candidate 
at the International Institute of Social Studies at Erasmus University, Rotterdam. And she has a long career working on human rights issues in, uh, in Southeast Asia. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our panelists now with uh, some questions and answers. And then at the end, we'll have a chance to uh, take some questions from the audience. Uh, if you can just uh, submit those via the chat function. Um, so first, uh, Rezwan, um, you've been affected directly by this crisis. Your sister and your niece uh, were on one of these boats for several weeks and then before making it to Indonesia. Um, I wanna turn to you first and just uh, have you tell us a little bit about that, that experience. First of all, uh, thank you all for this opportunity uh, to speak on this important panel about the Rohingya boat crisis today, about the Rohingya boat crisis. The boat crisis has directly affected me and my family. My sisters and niece have been, been stranded on one of the boats that finally made it Archie to the Archie Indonesia after over a month stranded in the sea. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Muhammad Ridwan, a 25 years old Rohingya refugee. Currently, surviving in the world largest refugee camp, Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. I'm a Rohingya writer and folklorist who wrote the Rohingya folk tale book. I'm also an anti-trafficking and human rights activist. Have been doing activism as much as I can to help the genocide survivor. I'm a Novik poet and was a teacher by profession. I've also been an access to many international journalists to navigate came, develop a stories, idea, and find resource. My sisters, Hatimun Nisa and her five years old daughter, Umme Salima, my niece, left the came in Bangladesh on 25 November 2022, leaving her elder daughter in the came along with my elderly mother. A few days after they got off the boat in Technaf in Bangladesh, the boatman informed the trafficker that they were stranded at sea through the boatman's satellite phone number. My sister was abandoned by her husband in Myanmar in 2016. We presume his date in the violence in her Khan. Since 2017, she had lived in country in Kutupalang refugee camp in Bangladesh. In the came, she had no one to take care of her and support her two daughters financially. So finally, she had to embark on a boat to Malaysia with 180 people. They were first destined to go to Indonesia and then to Malaysia or any third country from Indonesia to a humanitarian ground where her daughters would be able to go to a school and university to have a bright future. As well as she would find a new life, would get married with someone over there. She also hopes she could one day reunite with her other daughter who is now in the camp in Bangladesh once she settled. On 4 December, their boat's machine stopped functioning in the sea. I heard it from the smuggler on the same day on December 4. Perhaps the situation on the boat got frozen a few, a few days before the 4 December. Trafficker initially didn't tell us anything. They tried to resolve the matter on their own for consecutive three days. But when things so life out of their control, they inform us on December 4 and ask for help to the international community to save the life of the Rohingya people who were on the boat. To be honest, I didn't believe, believe it. I didn't, I even didn't imagine that they would have a such large phone number at that time. I thought it was just a game played by the smuggler to charge a big amount of money from us. At that some time when I could make a direct phone call with the boatman, I learned what the situation was really happening on the boat at that time. After having been stranded on the boat for about one week in the Thai water, where many Thai fishing boat and the Navy in the Andaman Sea saw them, over 20 people jumped into the sea in Thai water in the hope that the Thai Navy or fishing boat would rescue them and give them something to eat and drink. But that didn't happen, unluckily. In the boat, my sister and all Arab people hadn't eaten for 13 consecutive days. 
Only if there was rain, they could. They, uh, only if there was rain, they could in, in, they could drink drop of water to moisten their throat. The boat was then taken to Indian water by the current. We appealed to the regional government like Thailand, Malaysia, Sri Lanka, and India, Indonesia for their rescue. Sadly, almost every country denied our appeal to rescue them at the first trial. The Indian Navy then gave them some food and taught the boat to Indonesian water, Malacca Strait. 26 people died this way in the in Indonesia a lot, their disembarkation on 26 December. So they all thought they would die in the sea, but Almighty Allah saved their lives. Thank you. Thank you, Reswan, for sharing that. Um, I, I want to turn now to um, Weiwei. Um, Weiwei, you've, you've been in touch with uh, a number of women, Rohingya women who have been on the boat, some of which are, in, are now in detention in different countries. Could you tell us a little bit about what you're hearing from them and, and just what is, what is it that's driving people to, uh, to take these dangerous journeys? Uh, thank you, Dan. Um, actually, on behalf of the WPN, I also uh, like to thank the Refugee, Refugee International today for helping us highlight this devastating crisis uh, that affecting all of us, including um, esteemed speaker Rizwan and, um, and Ibu Yuyun. Um, the, um, I have, uh, over the past uh, two months, I have uh, been in contact and talked to uh, several members of the families of those who left and women um, in the detention centers and both themselves. Um, they were desperate uh, to get help. Uh, one of whom I have talked with, um, the a father of two, uh, a daughter and son who were in the boat still missing. And he still couldn't believe that his uh, children are, he still believed that his children are alive and uh, they would um, contact him um, uh, at some point. Uh, his um, son and daughter is on the boat, which is missing. Uh, who the boat led by Jamal Mahdi, which has a, a, about 180 people. Um, unfortunately, there is no discussions or no um, information about this boat, as well as no effort um, effort to 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 find and to search this uh, missing boat. Um, and this is just one example. Um, so we think the boat crisis. Um, Rohingyas deadly sea crossing need a greater international attention, uh, especially when their circumstances make it difficult for us uh, to access information. Um, and also what we know is that the boat crisis is not any one, but recently it has only gotten worse. Um, only in the last month, um, about 12, um, People, uh, 12 boat has uh, left and among them WPN actually attract five boats among uh, among these five boats one uh, of them is missing um, what uh, WPN can also share is that the crisis is severely uh, gendered um, like I said over the past uh, few months I have been in touch with over 30 women and their family members um, and um, a, lo a lot of them are survived, actually. Um, and, um, and a lot of them are, like, like you mentioned, in, in detention centers in different countries, including uh, Thailand, Sri Lanka, and Indonesia. Most of uh, these women survivors are adolescent, and as, uh, some are as young as seven. Uh, all of them recount to me um, their narrow escape from death. These women faced uh, on in their journey extortions, torture, as well as sexual exploitation, rape, and gang rape. They also witnessed these crimes um, being committed against their fellow women and children. And children dying dehydrated, dehy uh, children and women dying of dehydration and other preventative condition. None of these have access to justice in any jurisdiction. 
So they are forced to carry a level of trauma on top of the one they already carry as a survivors of genocide in Myanmar. A 13 years old uh, Fatima told me that if he, she knew this, uh, she has to uh, suffer and she has to face such a horrific experience, she would never leave the camps in, in the camp in Bangladesh. What is important to emphasize is that the crisis has been ongoing for years, especially due to the human rights and humanitarian catastrophe in Burma. Um, this catastrophe has been exacerbated by the Burmese military's decade-long crimes against humanity, against uh, ethnic minorities and genocide, uh, of course, that they, the Rohingya uh, continue to face. The February 1st attempted coup and its subsequent commissions of atrocities um, uh, amounted to crimes against humanity and war crimes across, uh, across the country. And um, um, the, uh, we have also reported that the, the junta is posing a growing risk of genocide um, um, to the over 600,000 Rohingya in Myanmar. Um, they, they include um, continuations of confinement of 140,000 Rohingya in IDP camps in Rakhine State. Um, our networks also tell me that uh, the feeling of hopelessness uh, following the attempted coup, the lack of safety and security in Rakhine State, uh, are also forcing them to take this deadly journey. Um, what's important to note uh, here is that the Burmese military has uh, upheld this apartheid-like condition for decades, in addition to persecuting other ethnic minorities in the, in the country. Um, as long as it is not held accountable, the military will continue to commit the atrocities um, and preventing Rohingya's sustainable and, and voluntary return. And as a result, we will see more people leaving not only from Rakhine, but also from, from the Bangladesh uh, refugee camps. Uh, over 1 million refugees uh, facing deteriorating conditions in Bangladesh is also a key factor contributing to this crisis. In its recent submission, um, in our uh, the VPN recent submission to the UN Special Reporter on Myanmar's human rights situations, uh, we have reported on refugees uh, tightening access to basic needs uh, and livelihood, as well as safety and protections in Bangladesh, in India, and also uh, uh, situations in Malaysia and other regional countries. Um, a group of 28 young women in Thai Immigration Center, uh, Detention Center, told, tell me that these circumstances have um, caused them to flee by boat. Um, they, some of them took um, uh, weeks to months uh, to get to, to uh, only to be arrested in Thailand or, or um, other places. These circumstances are also being facilitated by the communities, increasing um, access to human trafficking network that are being operated uh, by regional um, crime uh, syndicates and even local authorities in Rakhine and Bangladesh and other countries. Uh, it is likely that more Rohingya will attempt to uh, attempt this life-threatening escape for their uh, hope from if their host country's condition do not improve drastically. Therefore, in order to end the crisis we are facing today, Rohingya, including its women and girls need international and regional communities urgent support. Um, I'm looking forward to elaborating these points later in our discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Weiwei. Um, I, I think a couple of really important points. One is that People are leaving both from the camps in Bangladesh and uh, continue to leave from, from Myanmar. Um, and, and too often they're, they're being threatened either with detention or, or being returned to Myanmar where they're, they're also facing arrest. Um, and then that this is, you know, this is a regional crisis. This is, people are ending up in a lot of different countries. And so, uh, so now I wanna turn to Yu Yun for that, that regional perspective and particularly um, uh, you know, from, from Indonesia um, we know that um, Indonesia is now taking on the, the, the head of ASEAN um, and, uh, and, and many of the uh, Rohingya who have been on boats have, have uh, come to um, Indonesia. So uh, could you tell us a little bit about where, 
what is the thinking among uh, policymakers in Indonesia and in the ASEAN region more broadly, and what um, what kind of things should be done? Thank you, Dan, and thank you very much for having me in this important conversation. Uh, there has been a lot of concerns and sympathy, at least at the at the uh, Indonesia level. Uh, as you know, well, I've uh, attended the workshops last year uh, together with the local governments in Aceh. They um, expressed the uh, interest and sympathy based on humanity to rescue the Rohingyas stranded on the sea. Nevertheless, they question uh, on uh, the availability or the need of the system to allow them to do that. So for instance, they were uh, hindered with the lack of tools in terms of budget, for instance. It is not because not there is uh, there is no budget. There are budgets, but there is no item for them to allow to disburse the money. So if they use the money, so this is very technical, very practical, but it is very important because to rescue, to provide uh, food, to provide shelters, require uh, money from their local government. So at the moment, the budgeting of Indonesian government has no specific item in relation to uh, uh, rescue or uh, doing humanitarian uh, work for those who stranded uh, on the sea. So this is something that they have been uh, asked uh, to change the itemized uh, in the uh, a budget item in relation to uh, refugees. At the national level, I continue to hear that uh, rescue is very important on the name of humanity, but always the question is until when, because this continue to be uh, repetitively happen. Many policymakers now realize that Indonesia is no longer the secondary choice for, uh, uh, for Rohingya refugees after Malaysia or Thailand. The latest um, uh, uh, trips uh, from Rohingya from Kok Bazar actually shows that Indonesia becoming the first uh, destination uh, out from uh, uh, refugee camps. So it is very, very important for Indonesia to shift the thinking from being or perceiving as transit country into a place in which many refugees, including uh, Rohingya come to the come to Indonesia. It means uh, all responses, the budget item, the tools need to be rather permanent rather than transit. In Indonesia's policies in relation to refugees continue to be uh, in the in the stage of temporary. So that that is why the question on until when we do this, we are not. Uh, state party of the refugee convention because because it is it is set into uh, the thinking of transit so it is the time for Indonesia to think even though it is not state party to uh, con a refugee convention but thinking that we uh, Indonesia uh, is the uh, destination country uh, of uh, many refugees may Indonesia may have to establish um, a clearing uh, a center to be able to reach out to a third country for settlement or create a system to recognize uh, this uh, incident, the, the refugee, the, the identity of refugees. Thank you, Yoon. Um, I want to turn back to uh, Rezwan now. Um, so your, your sister and your niece are currently in Indonesia. Do you tell us a little bit what you're hearing from them about uh, the conditions they're in now, and and then just more broadly, what uh, any messages they have or you have um, for this broader audience and, and for global actors? <clears throat> yes, after one day of disembarkation in Asia, Indonesia, uh, we could talk with my sister and niece. Uh, and that call was facilitated by the Arab News and after one more week, CNN facilitated another call. So for two times, we could talk with my sister and niece for, for with my sister and niece in Indonesia. So according to her, uh, according to them, they were very much welcome and given whatever they needed by the kind-hearted and 
but by the kind-hearted and generous in, uh, Indonesian people and its government. For that, we don't have enough words, uh, enough words to thank them. So it's been over one month since we could last talk with my sister through a phone call. But yet, I don't know what's happening over there. Actually, the, they don't have a mobile, so it's very hard to reach out to them as well. So the United States should give them uh, should give them resettlement process from Indonesia. Actually, the Rohingya undertake this dangerous journey every year, mostly with NCOT basil, despite knowing the risks because there is no life for Rohingya in the came in Bangladesh and in the Arkana state, Myanmar. For, for us, for those refugees who live in the came, it's like an open air prison. It's not safe and secure at all. In Ustan, people were being tortured and kidnapped and killed in natural disaster and man made disaster in the cave. Also, the cove has placed in Myanmar by the military, gen by, by the military genta two years ago, made the Rohingya hopeless again in the situation of hopelessness. Although we went to go back home with certain dignity, we understand that it will never happen as long as the military remains in power. And also the Arakan army will never accept our identity as Rohingya. So we the Rohingya, uh, so we the Rohingya thanks the United States for being the biggest donor for us over the past few, year, few years, as well as for their genocide determination in the last year. To be honest, many things are yet to be done by the United States. Concrete action against the perpetrators who involved in the genocide directly and indirectly must be taken as soon as possible. The United States should also coordinate with other countries to give all the Rohingya youth the opportunities to assess higher education and become successful professional in various aspects so that we can liberate our own people by ourselves from the military's operation and tyranny. The United States should find a durable solution for the Rohingya before it gets too late. Otherwise, many people from the world's largest refugee came and from Myanmar will keep dying in the sea in the hope of finding a better life wherever is possible. Since we are human beings, we deserve human rights for just citizenship rights. I mean, for the Rohingya, becoming citizen is ultimate goal. For only citizenship rights, we have sacrificed many things. So how many more Rohingya have to be killed and died? And how long do we need to survive in the protracted situation in the game just for the citizenship right. So enough is enough, no more refugee life. So thank you very much. Thank you, Rezwan, for that, that really powerful message. I mean, I, I think I think you capture the, the, the mix of, of things that need to happen here, the fundamental uh, factors of, of Rohingya not having being recognized as citizens in, in Myanmar. Uh, and the need to um, to address what's happening with the the mil military, uh, but then also in the meantime, uh, providing um, further assistance to uh, Rohingya who are in the camps, given the access to quality education. Something that we've seen some movement on that, but um, uh, but but certainly there's there's more to be more to be done, and then uh, and then just trying to find some other solutions in the in the interim. Uh, I want to turn now back to Yu Yun um, and just ask. Uh, what messages you have in terms of recommendations on uh, whether it's what, what Indonesia and ASEAN can do or just more broadly to uh, address this. Thank okay, you. So, uh, sorry, uh, actually it was the network, uh, it was the network connection, uh, power network connection over here. So can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you Rezwan. Um, I think I'll, I'll turn to, we're gonna turn to you Yoon now and then we'll, we'll come back if you have uh, more that you wanna say. Okay. Thank you. 
Yuyun, over to you. Yes, I have a recommendation that I have been calling for years. Uh, this is my second term in ICHER, so from the beginning of me being the representative of Indonesia to the ICHER, I call for a regional refugee protection system in which this uh, mechanism uh, should be able to uh, coordinate, take a coordination role among member states. Uh, maybe some member states are reluctant to recognize or ratify or providing services, but at least ASEAN has one uh, a system in which uh, speaking on behalf of 10 countries. Um, so there is a no need to, perhaps if ratification is difficult now, but perhaps having a regional mechanism to function as coordinator, uh, clearing house, uh, a center of information and how to uh, monitor the movement of the people or, uh, in the region, that would be good. So this body may also can be the uh, a mirror of ASEAN to uh, engage with uh, the UNSCR, for instance. So uh, it, it doesn't mean that having this system or body will make the problem easier, but rather manageable for the region. I also would like to uh, I just read a, a state a press statement of the uh, ASEAN uh, ministerial meeting retreat in Jakarta on the 4th of February. I I like the the tax, but I don't like the tax in relation to uh, 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 Rohingyas because it it the the tax continue to be remain the same. Uh, from 2018 until now, uh, it's so it 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 actually shows different uh, meaning. First, there is nothing uh, happened, so that is why it doesn't change. Or maybe uh, we don't have enough information uh, uh, about what is actually happening uh, in the refugee camp or. Uh, what uh, uh, what happened in the country in Myanmar uh, in relation to uh, 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 return and reintegration? So I was very disappointed reading that text. Uh, um, uh, it's lack of uh, understanding about the realities, or maybe because we don't have information about the realities, uh, uh, considering that there are two COVID uh, two years of COVID nineteen. But it shouldn't be justification of of that. But um, I think I, ASEAN need to uh, change. Uh, as Ritzwan mentioned earlier, uh, we have to do something. Otherwise, it continue to come to our region uh, all the time. This issue will not be solved only by not doing anything. We should do something uh, to address the issue. Uh, but I understand uh, as being in the system by myself, uh, it's very difficult to reach consensus, but at least uh, there is something that a uh, member state may be able to uh, set the minimum uh, 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 agreement first, then evolve after that. At the moment, it seems like uh, zero effort. I met, you mentioned earlier, Dan, about the uh, incidences in 2015. There are a lot of uh, good uh, initiatives uh, there, are, there are a lot of good standards, but implementation seems uh, zero because of lack of political will, uh, lack of lack of interest from member states, and uh, seems like it is not in their radar uh, of having the community uh, uh, building of ASEAN. Thank you. And then I want to turn to Weiwei now. Um, similar question, you know, what is it, what is it that the United States or, or other countries uh, can and should be doing um, both on the Rohingya crisis and on a boat crisis specifically and more broadly, um, as you, you alluded earlier, that this is all connected to the broader uh, dynamics that are happening in Burma and, and treatment of other, other uh, ethnic minority groups or uh, people who are standing up for democracy in general. Um, so yeah, any, any reflections you have, thoughts on, uh, on what the US and other countries should be doing? Thank you very much, uh, Dan. Following the Rizwan and Ivo Yuyun's voice, points, um, as well as our, mine earlier, I urge all of you to see this crisis. Uh, this as a crisis that being facilitated by the international communities, 
multiple decades long failures to bring Rohingyas uh, out of their genocide. Uh, we saw this failure when the U.S. actually and certain other uh, governments didn't pursue measures to hold the Burmese military accountable immediately after 2017 attack of genocide and um, see it today when they rally on ASEAN's failed five-point consensus um, or when uh, governments in ASEAN and other regional countries are failing to sufficiently protect Rohingya refugees by refusing their disembargation or arresting and detaining them and, and threatening them with deportation to Myanmar. Or when the UNHCR and other international organizations still attempt to normalize their status quo in Myanmar and, um, and, and are failing to challenge the governments and provide um, protections and basics needs um, in Bangladesh or uh, in Thailand or in India or other regional countries. Rohingya refugees uh, from Bangladesh, Thailand and other countries, including in detention centers in India, actually shared with me that they have very limited access to UNHCR officials and officers and, and their support when they it, it clearly needed them the most. Um, and it is not to blame the great work that the UNHCR and other regional organizations doing, uh, working and helping them uh, to, to, uh, for, for their uh, uh, supporting their uh, needs and essential, but there is clearly a lot more that they can do to improve their relationship and to challenge the status quo to provide uh, support and protection. Um, these failures are now aggregated by the another wrong of uh, boat crisis, especially uh, they are exacerbated, uh, as exacerbating the, uh, the factors that have long forced to, um, Rohingya to take this precarious escape road. As I mentioned earlier, these factors include the tightening access to safety and protection in refugee uh, in in refugees um, in host countries and ongoing uh, human rights and humanitarian catastrophe and, and genocide in Myanmar. Uh, at the same time, the, um, the, the access to these humanitarian, uh, uh, sorry, human trafficking networks and um, allowing this network to uh, continue to, 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 to continue in, in in Myanmar and in, in Bangladesh and, and, and continue to network around the region. Um, and therefore, I think uh, to end such failure, it is important the US and other countries uh, to pursue uh, a more coordinated and effective actions um, that include uh, the, um, the, the international community must help Rohingyas host countries drastically improve their uh, provisions of basics, needs, and livelihood, as well as safety and protection, especially uh, over to over 1 million refugees in Bangladesh. As a world largest donor to the refugees, the US government can actually lead this change. Um, uh, second, these actions should also involve urgent provisions of sustainable and life-saving assistance to the Rohingya stranded in, in sea, at sea. Uh, there is no uh, organizations or government or coordination to uh, rescue through search and rescue uh, refugees stranded or adrift or drowned in um, in Andaman Sea. The U.S. government and related countries should assist uh, ASEAN and other regional countries to establish strategy to protect these refugees. Um, I, I like the proposal by um, by Ibu Union on having a uh, regional refugee coordination uh, body. This strategy should include the provisions of uh, search and rescue missions uh, and measures to uphold non refoulement principle and legal pathway for the Rohingya victims and survivors of uh, sexual violence and other crimes uh, from their escape to, uh, to seek a safe uh, just destination. Um, Especially, uh, specifically in India, Thailand, Malaysia, uh, UNHCR should uh, create accessible communication channel for the refugees so that they can uh, seek its assistance. Uh, 
Um, also, since the Bali process is, uh, the ministerial meeting is starting soon, I think ASEAN government uh, should definitely find um, uh, ways and strategy to effectively ha help Rohingya be in traffic and end in uh, trafficking net network and um, uh, find strategy to, to end the trafficking roads and its network and also provide protection and assist the big and survivors, particularly women and children. Um, just uh, one more, two more thing. Uh, one more thing. I think uh, overall, what uh, what is important is uh, for the international community to take the Rohingya uh, genocide and Rohingya crisis and subsequent uh, problems such as boat crisis as serious and a walk toward ending root causes uh, in Burma and in, in elsewhere. Uh, especially ending impunity in Myanmar. Uh, it is essential that the perpetrators of this uh, genocide, the, uh, the, the uh, heinous crimes, um, the military held accountable. Um, and the US government and other international community must do everything, uh, any means available, everything they can to hold the military leaders accountable, um, including uh, putting pressure and, uh, uh, and sanctions uh, uh, against the military and um, assisting or uh, facilitating um, a criminal justice processes. Um, yeah, um, it is. It is. It, it it's important for for these processes to. Um, at the same time, I think also uh, while helping taking this issue serious and helping Rohingya, it is also important uh, important that uh, in all of these processes, Rohingya are involved and Rohingya voices are reflected into in their in in their in their actions. Um, yeah, thank you very much uh, again, Refugee International, uh, and all of you joining us today. I hope we can help amplify amplify the voices of the of the people who need your help. Thank you. Thank you, Weiwei, and thank you all panelists. I, we're gonna move now to the uh, the question and answer from um, from the audience, and, and I see several coming in, and if anyone else wants to chime in, um, use the, the Q&A function um, on the Zoom. So the first question uh, that came in was um, about, uh, during the Vietnam boat crisis, uh, ships were chartered to pick up boat people at sea and save them from pirates and drowning. Have any large NGOs proposed launching such rescue ships to rescue Rohingya refugees? So, any any of the panelists um, have a, have an answer for that? Um, I I can uh, just say that I I know that ahead. there have been um, some I I know there have been discussions about NGOs that that have that capability. Um, I don't know that. I, I think it, it's a question of getting the uh, the governments in the region to agree to allow them to be doing that, and then a question once again, once people are saved, where where is their safe disembarkation, and where are they not just going to be moved to uh, detention centers? Um, so I think that's one of the uh, one of the solutions that's out there, um, but hasn't been uh, answered yet. And I see Wei Wei, and then Yu Yun had something to say. I think. Um... Finding ways uh, to um, establish mechanism for search and rescue uh, is essential. Uh, as far as I am aware, there was one um, NGO uh, in the past, um, around 2018, um, had a boat, but I don't think they were uh, actually able to do their job, or I don't know if they remain active, but I haven't been um, yeah, I, I haven't been in touch or um, aware of the work lately at all. Uh, so there was one attempt by one of the NGO um, from uh, from the U.S. Um, I don't believe they they are active, uh, but I think uh, it is essential whether through the NGOs uh, uh, or by the government themselves. There is a, there is a. a there need to be a a network or a mechanisms to send the rescue boats uh, to search and rescue boats. Thanks, you. you. Um, in Aceh, there is a Panglima Laut. Panglima Laut is like a institution, traditional institution for uh, fishers. So it is it is their norm to rescue anyone stranded on the sea. 
uh, they explained to me that uh, rescuing doesn't mean to uh, draw uh, to to grab their boat to the shore or anything. So very often the boat need food, need uh, gasoline, or need uh, medical support. Uh, so there are so many uh, level and of, uh, so many supports that they can offer. And that's the reason why many people, many newspapers actually uh, call it as the people of Aceh rescue uh, Rohingya stranded on the sea. But actually that's Panglima Laut. It is the traditional or indigenous norms uh, in maritime in Aceh. Indonesia is a maritime uh, country, but on as far as I know, only Aceh that has that kind of norms. And, and um, now, uh, more and more local government in Aceh uh, respect that uh, indigenous knowledge and um, uh, bring that into a practice. Even though it is not necessarily accepted by all at the moment, but gradually uh, it become the common norms. Uh, in ASEAN, uh, as a result of the boat crisis in 2015, there is a ASEAN uh, agreement uh, to rescue uh, uh, those who are stranded on the sea. So I think that's uh, uh, very much the, the title. Um, but not all countries implement that. Uh, last year, uh, Rohingyas, uh, uh, the boat of, of Rohingyas were, were sent to uh, Myanmar rather, rather than uh, uh, rescued by Vietnam uh, vessels. So that's against uh, uh, non-refoulement principle. So, so again, uh, I think there are so many good practices that are not necessarily known by the practitioners because it is not used. Uh, uh, perhaps uh, it is the time for uh, us to uh, to circulate this kind of both uh, collective norm or regional norms or uh, indigenous norms in relation to the maritime. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next question, or a few few questions coming for Rezwan, um, including some some folks who are working with uh, Rohingya in the camps. About I uh, want to hear a little bit more about what they can do best do to to help the Rohingya refugees, and what are the what are the out, outstanding needs, um, uh, or any other message you have for them, Rezwan, about um, what is most needed and what what would be most helpful. Especially, you know, uh, uh, UNSCO, uh, UN agency, and you know, every uh, every NGOs, you know, should give awareness to the to the Rohingya people, you know, uh, to the Rohingya refugees. Uh, uh, sh should give awareness about uh, about the about anti trafficking and you know that uh, the uh, the board the board journey is very risky and so. Every NGO should give them awareness and give them opportunity to assess, you know, to assess uh, to their need uh, that the, that the refugee had in uh, in the camp in Bangladesh. And also, you know, uh, the international community, you know, uh, uh, should uh, should give them the, uh, should give the Rohingya family, you know, to reunite their families. Actually, you know. Uh, the, uh, there are many Rohingya people in Malaysia, so their families are living in the camp. So they are trying to reunite their families in any possible way. But finally, you know, they have to choose the journey on the sea. So I urge our international community to give them the opportunity to reunite with their families, uh, with their families, and also I ask the local NGOs and UN agency, you know. Uh, to give, you know, awareness to the people, you know, living in the camp, to give awareness uh, 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 to the Rohingya people living in the camp, in the uh, who are having, you know, uh, Malayas who are having Malaya for over five years. So otherwise, many people would get, you know, mentality disorder in the camp. Thank you, Rezwan. Um, the next next question I, I think is is, is aimed at uh, Yu Yun. Um, a couple of different questions I'll just uh, put together uh, about the regional um, challenges and, and opportunities. Um, so, 
the let me get this here. All right. Um, yeah, the, there's a question about a um, the mention of a regional refugee protection mechanism, how that could come to place, uh, considering a clear lack of consensus among, among ASEAN countries to address the Rohingya crisis. And similarly, um, you know, just more generally, what is it that uh, that we as activists or people, um, you know, uh, who care about this can do um, to to motivate ASEAN countries uh, to do the right thing um, in response to this crisis. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for the question. Uh, if I may, I would like to answer the last one first. Um, I, I think this is misleading as well. If we see, if we thought that all ten ASEAN member states uh, refuse refugees, they hosted the refugees for years. Uh, so that is why additional number of refugees, in, in their opinion, uh, it's adding to their burden, national burden. So that is, so that is why. Um, during COVID-19, the COVID-19 has been used as a reason of uh, refusing uh, ref uh, refugees of, of, uh, coming in. Uh, but now they, they continue to use another reasons, but many member states uh, uh, think that it's already, they have, they hosted a lot of refugees already, and uh, it's it's a burden to their national uh, uh, budget or, or responsibilities and so on and so forth. But Philippines actually had been calling, inviting uh, Rohingya specifically to come to Philippines, but uh, no one come. Now Philippines has a project uh, on giving a, a, a fellowship, a scholarship for Rohingyas. Uh, so they have to recruit uh, uh, Rohingyas coming into uh, Philippines. Last one was there. There was uh, around 19 students from the refugee scams uh, are now studying in the Philippines using the uh, fellowship scheme uh, under the presidential office, if I'm not mistaken. And it is the implementation from the global compact on on refugees. Uh, but there are a number of uh, opinion why Rohingyas did not go to Philippines. First, perhaps it's very far away from uh, where they where they were. Second, they were not informed. Uh, Rohingyas were not informed about uh, the Philippines, uh, the culture, and so on and so forth. And the the, the decision to go to Malaysia or Thailand. Uh, 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 in line with what Rizwan mentioned because they want to reunite with families there. Indonesia was not uh, the, uh, the first country of the choice because even though Indonesia uh, dominated by Muslim, uh, but, uh, but, but only lately that they come to Indonesia. Um, many local governments in Aceh also found number of Rohingyas refugees are, until certain uh, number of days they will gone out from the refugee, uh, refugee uh, uh, center, not because they have been moved to other countries, uh, the other center, but they have been crossed to Malaysia. And that practice uh, happen all the time. And because uh, refugees have a uh, free will, they, they really want to reunite with the family and the selection of countries where they want to go uh, really depend on their understanding, their culture, the, the proximity of culture, and the prior information that they receive about the countries. Now, uh, I think there has been a number of information about Indonesia, so they go to Indonesia. But I, uh, so when uh, Philippines open up to receive refugees, no Rohingya went there or choose uh, Philippine as uh, one of the options. So, so just to give you the, the, the context that not all member states are close their door uh, for refugees, but very often it is not what Rohingyas want to go or feeling uh, or, or become the decision uh, uh, part in, in choosing the countries. Uh, some um, According to UNSCR, all countries in Southeast Asia hosted a certain number of refugees. And uh, the first uh, reason is always about burden. One of the reasons why they don't ratify the convention because uh, they will be given more responsibilities 
beyond their uh, responsibilities to the citizens. So there is a lack of understanding about perhaps the, the convention, the responsibility of the state or uh, contribution to the, to the, to the region. Uh, if they ratify the convention, if the, they host more uh, refugees, what would be the contribution to the region? I, I don't think this is uh, something this has been discussed. Very often I found uh, the issue of refugees uh, were rather the, the topic that will be avoided by member state to be discussed at the regional level. Uh, the, the first question was, oh, on refugee uh, protection, regional refugee protection uh, system. Um, it has been, I have been calling for this uh, 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 system no one buy it, but it doesn't. So, so it's a matter of making it repetitive uh, to allow certain uh, space uh, for discussion at the regional level. Uh, but so I, I believe that if we have uh, a space to talk about it, to to elaborate this, to 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 check whether uh, what what pro and cons, advantages and advantages, then we will be able to create. Um, a system that fit with the region. At the moment, all doors are closed uh, to discuss about the regional uh, protection refugee system. Uh, but of course, I, I I do not want to accept it is rejected. <laughs> um, I think we should just have to uh, make the 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 system uh, down to earth as possible. That many member states feel that it is doable. Uh, yeah, rather than looking at it at, as a, a burden to the country. Thanks, Yijun. Uh We have just a couple minutes left, so I, I think I'll, what I'll do is give you each of the speakers uh, just one minute left to uh, to say anything further they want to. Um, and just looking at the remaining, there's several remaining questions, but I'll say just three kind of categories if anyone wants to touch on those. One is just the, the kind of the nature of the trafficking networks, where they're getting funding, how they're working. Another is on um, resettlement um, opportunities, both to third country, traditional third country resettlement and within the region, and then on communications, and especially how can, how can refugees who are in detention or in other countries uh, be given better opportunity to communicate with their families. Um, so with that, uh, let me, I'll, I'll go Rezwan, Weiwei, and Yu Yun, uh, just very, very quickly, because we're coming close to time. Thank you. Rezwan. Any final thoughts or answers to any of those questions? Just a, a quick minute, Rezwan. You're on mute. Yeah, you yes, I, yes, yes, I have a final appeal to the international community. That is, please send us back to Myanmar as soon as it is possible or resettle us to any third country so that we can hope for a better life. We do need to stay, we do need to stay in the in the fortress situation for one more single days. So our final appeal to the wall is: please take an urgent step to solve our cases, our crisis. Our to solve our crisis, there is two options: please send us back to our motherland with safety and dignity, or please resettle us to any third countries so then we can hope for a better life. This is my final appeal to the international community especially the U.S. and other powerful countries in the world. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rezwan. Um, and, and thank you for being concise. Um, uh, Weiwei? Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks much. I think, first of all, it is uh, essential and a must that there is a um, immediate action to uh, send rescue and, and search and rescue missions. Um, if there's a political will, there is a lot of tools and, and uh, technology available actually to, to do search and rescue. Um, they can deploy satellites and send ships to the to the Andaman, Andaman Sea. Uh, I think the, the political will and then coordination is essential among the countries, ASEAN countries, uh, Indonesia, um, the, the Indian including India and Sri Lanka. And, and it was devastating to hear that the, the, the Indian uh, Navy actually give uh, some food uh, to the refugee to, to one of the boat and then, and then uh, leave them as it is without rescuing. So uh, Arjun, so we have to 
categorize it. The urgent response, immediate response at the same time, addressing the longer term issue. If us in, uh, and regional government, this government doesn't want to take this refugee as their burden, and there is as it is it is absolutely critical that they help their Rohingya refugees to address the root causes of persecution that they face in Burma, right? So if you don't want to do both, it it doesn't make any sense. You have to do if cannot if you cannot take responsibility to end the root causes in Burma, to end the genocide in Burma, to hold the militaries accountable, you need to carry the burden. You 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 have a one you know you have to choose one. You cannot just say we cannot do anything. You cannot rescue refugee, and you cannot help us address the, uh, the uh, our suffering. It's 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 absolutely insane and, and unacceptable. Um, and second, uh, it is essential to end uh, the human trafficking uh, network to take actions against them. And a, a lot of the local authorities are involved in in all of this uh, network from Burma to Bangladesh to Thailand to Malaysia to elsewhere. And it is absolutely uh, critical that they take uh, effective actions to end the human trafficking. Lastly, the US and international community can help uh, improve situations in at least in, in Bangladesh uh, by providing effective support and protections mechanisms, including uh, supporting the, 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 the educations and, and other, um, other um, livelihood support so that they can sustain and they can and live of them, uh, themselves and, and they, there is a safer situation. Um, like I mentioned, a lot of these women, young people are leaving the, the camps because they don't feel safe and they don't feel uh, uh, there is a hope there, there is they can survive anymore. Uh, safe Safety means from the just living, sleeping at, in their tent, 10, 10 foot square uh, plastic tent to going out or uh, the, the, the threat against their life itself. So they're, they're the small thing to bigger safety. There are a lot of need that can be improved uh, uh, in the camp. And, and there is a, a need for uh, to focus on this, this area so that we can reduce number of people leaving from the refugee camps in Bangladesh. Thanks, Weiwei. Yu Yun, any final thoughts? I would like to take this opportunity to uh, thank civil society organizations uh, and uh, express my admiration of their work because I've seen uh, Indonesian policies, for instance, on refugees have been changed from time to time. It was very slow, but it changed from time to time. This is the situation now never been imagined before by having right to education for refugee children. Now we are talking about the right to livelihood for refugees. So I hope by the convening power that IHR has uh, on human rights and also the multi-layered channel of diplomacy that ASEAN has, we will be able to meet in the middle to, um, to maximize and ma materialize what uh, civil society has done for years in terms of fulfilling the right of refugees. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to all of our panelists and for everyone watching. Um, and uh, there will be a recording of this that, that goes up as well. Uh, so keep an eye out for um, uh, refugeesinternational.org and also on the Women's Peace Network uh, website. Um, again, uh, thank you very much. And um, we, we appreciate all of your, your attention to this. Uh, and with that, I'll close out the, uh, the webinar. Thank you.